<clears throat> Good afternoon and welcome to the Marine Fish Conservation Network's Waterside Chat. I'm Tom Sadler, the network's deputy director, and I'll be your host today. Our, our goal with our Waterside Chats is to hear from challenges and opportunities from people across the waterfront. It's an opportunity to learn and, and, and um, about issues that face them and their communities. I am really delighted to welcome our guest today, Chef Dana Hahn. Chef Hahn is the owner of Carmo, a restaurant in New Orleans, Louisiana. I'll be talking with Chef Hahn about seafood, the culinary world, and his involvement in, re in marine resource advocacy. Um, a before we get started, a, a, a couple of uh, housekeeping items. If you have questions for Dana, please put them in the chat and we'll do our best to get to them. Um, we're also recording this chat and, and it'll be available on YouTube, Facebook, and our website as soon as we can get it ready. I'm looking forward to a great conversation. I know you are. Welcome, Dana, and um, let's get started. And let me set the stage here, Dana. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, where you grew up, where you went to school, stuff like that, what you studied, and most importantly, how you became a restaurateur in Louisiana. Well, great. Well, first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's, it, it's, uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, uh, I, you know, I grew up in a small, well, I, I should say I, I was born in a very small town in Kansas and grew up in a small town. So when I say born in a small town, I mean, you know, 400 people. And when I say grew up in a small town, I mean, 1200 people. So, uh, and, you know, I lived uh, half of my childhood in uh, Kansas. And then we moved to Nebraska, which was like the next step up, I guess, from from Kansas. Uh, nothing against Kansas. I still love Kansas. Um, and there I went to high school and uh, started at the University of Nebraska and uh, moved. Well, started at Hastings College, actually a small liberal arts college. Then went to the Nebraska of Iowa, or, uh, Nebraska of Iowa after the Nebraska of, uh, Nebraska, after the University of Nebraska, and studied uh, music composition and Indian studies. So two of the most, you know, kind of uh, useful degrees that you can possibly have. And uh, so the, uh, by the time I went away from there, um, you know, I had met my uh, present. Uh, my only wife, and uh, <laughs> I don't want to say uh, president, but um, uh, Christina, and she's Brazilian, and uh, so we moved to Brazil, lived there for seven years, and uh, ended up moving to San Francisco, and there we had a small weekend cooking school and uh, production company that we did quite a bit of catering for different types of events, including film, Moved that down to New Orleans two months before Katrina. Perfect timing. And uh, that's kind of, you know, we've been here since. And, um, you know, we've, uh, we've been kind of steadily growing Carmo and opened a second restaurant called Cafe Cour after that. So that's kind of where we're at now. Great. Well, um, I, if Christine here, Christina hears us, uh, I think that was a, a slip of the tongue, not, <laughs> not, a, not a preview of coming attractions, not as they say all. out west. She knows better. She knows better. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, well, that's terrific. So um, tell us a little bit about Karma. Okay. What's the food like? Um, yeah. What re a little bit more about what inspired you to open a restaurant. Um, and, and then I want to talk a little bit about... Um, your your support for local farmers and fishermen so let's but let's okay. start with the, the the restaurant and a little bit about uh the second restaurant sure um so carmo is a tropical restaurant and when i say that it's it's more it, it's less uh eye patch and a parrot and more equatorial you know heritage cuisine so um i know a lot of people when they hear tropical restaurant they think caribbean and even like a subset of that but now we're we're focused on 
tropical foodways and the heritage dishes um, from equatorial regions that are typically either not represented or very underrepresented in kind of our canon of ethnic restaurants in, in the United States. And, um, you know, in terms of inspiration, I mean, it's pretty wide, but having lived in Central or in, in South America, specifically Brazil, but then traveling a lot throughout Central uh, throughout Mexico, throughout uh, the Caribbean, and just realizing that there, there are these sorts of places that are, uh, for want of a better word, just kind of casual and fresh and, um, you know, places where, you know, every day just means serving what they have available. And, um, you know, typically um, in, you know, kind of intrinsically those places have a lot more to offer as far as I'm concerned. And um, we, we experienced that quite a bit, you know, when we were living down there and having returned to San Francisco, we really thought about doing something in San Francisco at the time. It was right after the, well, right towards the end of the dot-com boom and you know doing anything commercially there was just impossible you know the 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 availability of commercial real estate was ridiculous um and so you know eventually when we ended up in in uh, new orleans and and we we started back up the catering here and did very well with that working with uh like the food uh, the southern food and beverage museum and different uh, uh, sorts of organization, a lot of nonprofits doing work with them. Um, that kind of gave us a base of, of support so that when we did open Carmo, we had at least a trickle of people who kind of knew what we were trying to do. Um, uh, in terms of uh, kind of one other part of the inspiration that I would, you know, that I say is kind of essential, but at the same time is the loftier goal is um, what I call origins to table. And, um, you know, we're looking at the food ways from the beginning, at the very beginning, the people who created the food, who grew the cultivars, who created the traditions that became the traditions that we know. And so along that lines, farm to table is included, of course, that's closer to where we're at. But before that, there's all kinds of, um, there are a lot of stories that people don't know. And so the whole idea of, of Carmo in the beginning was providing that narrative, providing those heritage dishes, but providing the narrative of where that comes from. And, um, you know, so I think that over the years, we've done that to greater or lesser degrees at different times. And we're always trying to figure that, you know, crack that nut as it were. It's, um, it's we've never quite gotten there a hundred percent. But then, you know, if, if the, to, to take that, that kind of idea one step further, um, the idea that, that of telling the tropical narrative um, comes from, a place that, or, or the idea and the reality that 80 plus percent of what's on the world's plate came from original, originally from tropical zones. And, um, you, know, uh, you know, there are all sorts of things wrong with our food system. There are all sorts of challenges that we face globally from, you know, poverty, climate change, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, issues uh, with pollution, etc. The the tropics are typically um, uh, affected first in most of those regards. And that means that our literally the, uh, you know, the ancestors um, uh, that, that, that cultivated that food, that, that took the wild seeds and made them into cultivars um, are, you know, and those, those traditions are, are also threatened. Not to mention the fact that, you know, in a lot of places, those, you know, we can talk about, um, you know, ancient seed and, you know, wild, you know, uh, predecessors to ancient cult cultivars still being present in some of those places. So there are a lot of reasons, but, but essentially we feel like, you know, there are a lot of things that need to be fixing, but there's one thing that if we could fix it, 
it might make more difference than anything is our food system. And even doing a little part along that way, telling the narrative so people at least know what that means is essential. I'm sorry, that's kind of a <laughs> meandering explanation, but it really was, you know, the first thing that came to us 12 years ago. So, um, yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's very helpful. And it's, and it's interesting when we talk about those tropical food ways and, um, you know, we're, you're, you've taken us back hundreds of years and now we're here in 2022 and, um, you know, you and I have spoken a bit about, um, and you've written about <clears throat> innovation, adaptation, accessibility in, in the culinary world. And, and if you'll bear with me for a moment, for our audience who may not have read it, I want to read a quote from an op-ed you wrote in Civil Eats. And your quote was, the scorpion fish is one of a number of species that would have unlikely made it onto our menus just a few years ago. Instead, it would have been thrown overboard and before the boat made it to the dock. Unfortunately, fortunately, it's delicious and, it, and including it on a menu takes a little pressure off heavily targeted species like tuna and red snapper. This shift is just one small example of our region's capacity for co cooperation, creativity, and adaptation. Now, most of us wouldn't think about scorpion fish as sort of a restaurant, a, a menu item. Mm -hmm. And what you wrote there represents your, at least my impression of your culinary point of view. And um, a lot of what you were just talking about in terms of bringing those tropical food ways forward. Um, so um, talk to us a little bit about um, how you source those menu items and, 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 and reach out into the community. Well, I think, uh, first of all, you know, one, one thing that, that uh, occurs to me a lot is that I, myself included, chefs, we, we tend to make a lot of presumptions and assumptions about, about what our audience might be willing to try. Um, the more I step outside of that box, the more I realize that's completely uh, something that I've constructed in my mind that has very little base in reality. So uh, the, over the past, really over the past 10 years, because we've, we've gotten more heavily and or just had more doors open for us as well in terms of our sourcing alternative species, um, you know, we, we've been able to um, really grow our audience by offering things that people aren't able to find at other places. Now, on a high end level, going to have omakase at your favorite, you know, expensive sushi place, people have sometimes have that mindset. Maybe beyond that, it's a little bit different. But what happens is that, that um, as people are exposed to things over a period of time, they become they become much more willing to try. They also come to a point where we, we have people come in every night. It's like, okay, so what's the new fish tonight? You know, they want to try something new. And um, I think that, that, uh, that it does take time, but I think it, it's also something that that's in everybody's uh, reach um, in terms of like sourcing and, and, you know, establishing those relationships, because it really is number one, all about relationships. And, uh, you know, so we have great relationships with, with a couple of uh, fishers specifically. Um, you know, the, the one other thing I realized, you know, I, I have a list that I, uh, that I put together that has about 85 species that we've served at Karma over the past, really, that, that's for the past five years. And, um, you know, one thing I do is when I start to look at, you know, because you can read a lot, for example, scorpion fish or Jack Caval is a great example because Jack Caval is still locally anyway, considered kind of a trash fish, which I hate that word to begin with, but people, you know, people care, they like to catch it because it puts up a good fight, especially, you know, the, 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 the recreational anglers love to catch it on a fly rod even better you know um but 
you know, typically it would be either thrown back in best case, worst case, it might be just left, uh, you know, on, on the deck and not, you know, maybe cut up for bait, who knows. But the reality is that, that you know, even though once those fish get a little bit bigger, they, they, they change, the, the quality and texture of the, of the meat changes a lot. Um, it's still very usable and delicious if you if you open your mind in terms of how you prepare it. And the younger fish is actually great. It's it's uh, you can even use it for ceviche. So there's there are applications for nearly every fish that that uh, we've encountered. And had I gone with you know at face value, I don't you know, like face value has to go out the window with in this regard. Because if you take take everything at face value, you'll never get beyond those ten species that everybody has on their menu. And um, yeah, and then the last thing I would say about the sourcing is you've got to you got to you know I found out very quickly um, you you can't be wishy washy about your commitment to your producers. Um, they need assure you know they need to be assured that if they're going to produce something that they have a market for it. And if you can give them a guaranteed market for it, that's even better. So that's what we try to do. Um, and, you know, uh, we, we I, I think have in a few instances helped uh, create, you know, new markets for, for different things uh, here locally as well. Awesome. Um, well, so that kind of leads me into the, to the sustainability question. It's one of the things that um, you you and the restaurant have been recognized for. You've garnered accolades and um, certifications from local and national environmental and conservation organizations, including the Green Restaurant Association and Seafood Watch. Tell us a little bit about sustainability in 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 your the context of your restaurant and your menu. Well, you know, that uh, obviously that word is loaded and there's been a lot of discussion a lot around that lately. But, you know, I mean, for, for a lot of folks, uh, that has to do with the biodegradable containers and the recycling and composting and, and oil upcycling for biofuel and, and all of that. But for us, it, it, and it does, we do all of that, um, you know, and at the end of the night, our, the, the little bag of trash that actually goes out and our makes our uh, you know uh, dumpster look cavernous. So um, you know it. What and actually that that's another you know making making sustainability profitable is the next level in that. So right now we're we're fighting for net metering of garbage so that I'm not paying the same as my neighbors who have two giant dumpsters full of, of trash at the end of the night, well, um, which obviously costs the city way more. Um, so things like that. Um, but, um, you know, beyond that, it's really about, it's the sustainability circle involves that plus labor practices, plus, you know, things like career development and paid leave and, and, um, you know, it involves your staff and it involves your customers and it involves your producers, you know, so it's, it's all the circle. And so building that circle again is building community and that's what sustainability is, is community. So that's what we're, we're constantly working on community really. And, and, and in terms of sustainability, it would seem to me, and you can amplify this if you will on you know, when you take, when you go off that, um, taking those those 10 most popular fish and go on to something else like scorpion fish, um, you've, you've created an opportunity for sustainability in that, in those ocean resources. Is, is that- Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, actually, you know, and there, there are exceptions where, you know, there are, there are non-targeted species that, that we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't be, you know, uh, certainly shouldn't be targeting, um, you know, because whatever the stock or the ecosystem, um, the way that their, uh, the methods, the fishing method or harvest methods may not be ideal 
um, you know, like for a certain reef fish or, or, or whatever. So, you know, there are some, some things that we just are, are better left untouched. And the whole idea of bycatch isn't, gee, how much more uh, bycatch can we get? It's, gee, how, how low can we get our bycatch? And secondly, okay, now what do we do with, with the rest of it? You know, so that's always, you know, it's like um, sometimes, you know, the, the idea of, of getting these exotic fish um, you know, exotic species, um, you know, are kind of catch 22, because what we really want to do is make it so that we're only picking up what, what we're going for. So, um, yeah. Do, do you think that, or are you seeing within <clears throat> um, the, the culinary community in your region, but also I know you, you play on a, on a large, much larger sta sca um, stage, are you seeing that shift towards, um, you know, the non-common fish, the the bycatcher or, or or exotics? I mean, to me, fish is fish. It's just, yeah, uh, you know. Uh, but are, are others picking up on that? And 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 is there a way to, in your mind at least, um, improve? how the the community and and you know we'll get into congress and all that in a bit yeah. but could 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 promote that yeah i think yeah definitely i mean one way that most people you know most chefs get their their fish through distributors right now distribution is the weak link and you know that's for a number of different reasons a lot of it political some of it just clumsy um but the fact is that you know we i've spent you know, several years working with, um, you know, my contacts at a couple of distributors to make sure that they know when I ask where something is from, I don't mean, you know, if it's, you know, what ocean it's from, you know, I mean, uh, you know, and, and being able to rely on, you know, the information that, that distributors provide um, and asking for it only makes them more apt over a period of time um, to get that information, make sure that information is being provided by our fishers. So that, that's one thing, um, you know, and then, and then education, because one, you know, one thing I do uh, uh, once a month or once every six weeks or so is meet with a group of, of chefs, mixture of chefs, some uh, from Noki, which is our culinary institute, here and um, it's kind of all about these different species. They're very, very curious. They want to use different things, but but unfortunately, that's not a part of a lot of you know culinary programs. I have to say, um, many folks barely know how to break down a fish. Maybe in concept they know, but then switch from you know from a you know from a snapper. Uh, to to a hake and or a flounder even and and you know it's out the window so um, you know I, I feel like you know we could be doing a better job of just educating our chefs to use you know more you know to be a little bit uh, more adventurous and by that I don't mean um, you know haphazard there's a the, you know probably the foremost part of this is safety and making sure that they they know that you know there are certain species that don't get made into ceviche there are there are certain um you know certain uh ways that that you know certain types of fish work better for certain preparations or whatever it is so do you feel like um there's sufficient opportunity at this point to get the the, the education message out there or are there things that people could be doing to, um, you know, influence their peers? Um, you I know. think that one thing that, that we, yeah, one thing that we have to get beyond is this competitive thing that, that a lot, so many, you know, the, you know so, so many, you know, brigade systems and so many restaurants around this country and it's, and it's, you know, so chef driven, which I understand, you know, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, you know, it's competitive. But the fact is that, that, um, 
you know, at least to the point that we all have uh, a good idea of, of the, um, for example, the, the, the possibilities that are out there, it, it shouldn't be competitive. We, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't feel like if I, uh, you know, teach somebody how to, how to break down, you know, a lionfish that I'm, you know, losing something, you know? I, I, hopefully I'm gaining some, you know, uh, you know, potential, um, you know, uh, a partner and, you know, making, uh, our, our system better, work better. So, yeah. well, is it, is it fair to say that, that as you educate people, you're, you're not really com creating competitors as much as you're spreading out the, the, the knowledge in a way that allows for future. It's one of the things, the future of fishing, the future of using yeah. seafood, understanding that, you know, if you're going to, to go down this culinary path, if you will, that um, there's a, there's a, a an ethos, a, an ethic here a, that, that you need to be able to do this so that we have fishing into the future. We have these resources into the future. Is that fair? Absolutely. No, I, that's a that's a great point that, you know, I mean, it's not, it's not just each individual chef trying to, you know, uh, eke out their part of the market and protect it. You know, we're talking about the livelihood of, of our fishers and generations of fishers. And if we don't do something now to help them, um, you know, we're all screwed. We got, we have to act now because, you know, they're hurting. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I, I'm taking that from our local fisheries and knowing what the struggle is like and extrapolating it. But I'm pretty sure that that's, that's the case throughout most of our national fisheries. And, um, you know, we just, we just, as chefs are, you know, you know, one of our primary concerns should be the long-term viability of our, you know, the, the sources of our food. And that's people, you know, again, it's community. For, for, for sure. And I think, you know, and I'm not saying this just because I've got you on the, on the, on the uh, chat here, but um, there is an opportunity <clears throat> as a, um, a user, if you will, of, of that resource to make your voice heard. And um, do you feel like you and other chefs are willing to make, to, to, to I know you are, but, but are others willing to make that sort of I, I, political investment, I guess, is part of what I'm trying I, to get I think, at. I think they are. They just have to be shown a viable way to get there. You know, I, I liken it in some ways is similar to, you know, trying to get, you know, my chef friends that, you know, will, will listen to me anyway, to not use, uh, you know, uh, foam containers, you know, for so many different reasons, you know, but, you know, I, and I, I ended up writing a little, you know, 10, 10 item bullet point about how, how it can be a net positive in terms of revenue. Um, and, and there's always a way, you know, there's always a way to, to make that work for you and, and your particular, uh, situation, restaurant, whatever it is. And, um, but, but, you know, we need to, again, we need to share, share information in order to do that. And if we can't get out of our little, our little, um, chefy shell, then we're, we're in trouble again. Um, okay. Well. I'm, I'm, I may come back to this. I've got a couple of questions. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna hit a, a couple of questions, and I'm and I'm really just gonna read them because I'm not sure I completely understand. Okay. So it may make sense to you, and if it <clears throat> if if I butcher it, I apologize to the folks that are asking. But one of the questions is um, from from your perspective, please talk about current versus uh, indigenous aquaculture and contemporary folk can share and interpret ancient tenets 
not sure where I'm going with that, but. Well, in terms of yeah. like contemporary versus indigenous aquaculture, I mean, things that, you know, the, there's obviously been different sorts of aquaculture for millennia. And, you know, much of that was done, you know, very much in harmony with its, you know, local surroundings. So it seems to me anyway, it seems, um, pretty clear that it's possible, you know, sustainable aquaculture. But our problem, once again, is that, you know, people look at, for, uh, at it from upside down and they start with, guys, what's, your, what's the, the worst possible feed we can give these fish? Or what's the, <laughs> what's the largest uh, biomass that we can destroy and, and feed to, you know, it, it, it's just ridiculous. Right. So our, our, our uh, you know, our, our ancient ancestors certainly didn't start that way. Right. And I don't know why we should either. So um, I don't know if that, that addresses specifically the difference they're talking about, but that's, that's a comment. Well, that, that, that works. Um, so another question came in is why deal with distributors rather than buying direct from small scale fishermen? And I think that's something you've yeah. talked about with with um, Lance Nacio and yeah. and and maybe that gets at that question a little bit. It um, you know it, it depends a lot on where you are. Uh, we happen to be in a state where there's a system. There's basically a wall that's built up between fishers and chefs. So the state of Louisiana is not friendly in terms of like uh, a chef can't go down to the docks and buy off the boat. Really? Unless, unless the fisher has the right licenses. Or uh, I, can, I can buy, if I want to buy direct from a boat, I need to have a wholesale resale license, a wholesale retail license, I'm sorry. Um, which, which is a lot of hoops for a lot of restaurants to jump through. We've established rest or uh, relationships with, um, including Lance, um, a few different fishers over the years. So, uh, and it happens that they have the right permits that allow us to do that. Now, you can go next door to Mississippi. I believe it's totally different over there. If I could be on the dock every day, I would. You know, that's where I would be every morning. Um, or however often they're coming in sure. um, to, to meet them, because I, I want to make sure that, that uh, you know, they're, they're getting, you know, what they need from, from our relationship too. And, I, and I'm, you know, I think that there are a lot of distributors, not all, but there are a lot of distributors that take a lot out of that transaction and end up, instead of having a two day or, or less boat to table you have 14 days right you know which is not unheard of in places like new orleans where sometimes stuff's going up to atlanta to get processed and then you know it could be six days on the boat you know and then another two days up to atlanta another two days back another two days before it's out of the fish house so not fish i'll say distribution because we actually have a local distributor called fish house they're very good so yeah <laughs> well, we don't want, we don't want to diss them i, I don't want anybody to be yeah confused about that yeah um so let me um let me switch gears because you mentioned at the beginning of this you talked about katrina and clearly climate change and louisiana has been I, 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 I maybe I'm not too far off the mark when I say ground zero for being battered by hurricanes could, you know, obviously Katrina and then more recently Ida. Um, can you sort of share your, your, your experiences with those events and, and both how you recovered? And then I know you're involved in a, a, a project down there. And if I get this, then pronunciation you or Colin can contract my poor Yankee butchering of, of Louisiana speak, but mid bear a trail. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the sediment diversion. So can yeah. you, can we talk about that for, for, for a couple minutes? Yeah. Yeah. In terms of the hurricanes, you know, we're, you know, obviously the, um, we went through Katrina in 2005. We, uh, we had just moved here 
and uh, two months before that happened. So we didn't have a great deal of experience. And, and we were also very lucky. We lived in a part of town that they called the sliver by the river. So, um, you know, we didn't have to deal with flooding. We did have wind damage and things like that. Um, you know, and, and a lot of the grand ideas that we had come with down to Louisiana were kind of put on hold. But, um, you know, again, we were very lucky. Um, Ida happened in uh, 21, August of 21. And again, it seems like the end of August is always, you know, same thing with Katrina. It's always everybody gets a little bit nervous that something might happen. And, and um, you know, and, and in some ways, Ida was a new experience for a lot of folks who had um, moved to Louisiana. And, you know, we still have people who are displaced from Katrina who have never come back. I mean, a great number of people. Uh, who couldn't come back and would still want to come back. Um, some who found better life other places, you know, so, um, but, you know, and, and that's the thing, there's always that reality check in, in, in the back of your mind. It's like, okay, we're moving forward with all these plans. We're going to put this, make this investment, you know, build this, whatever it is, is it going to be gone next year? You know, so, but, you know, the thing is that if, 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 if we continually second guess our, you know, our, that instinct to, to move forward, then I think that, that we're really lost. So, you know, if we choose to live down here and it's a great place to live, it's a very high quality of life in spite of so many different um, shortfalls and challenges. But um, I, you know, I, I feel like if we, if we don't have that um, that mindset, it's it's very hard to make a, a way of it down here. So, um, and then in terms of the, you know, there are a lot of different um, uh, there are a lot of different types of restoration projects, coastal restoration projects. Of course, the diversions are very much in the news right now. Um, there are sediment diversions. Some of them um, would be through kind of canal-based diversions. Um, some of it would be more kind of opening up, um, you know, uh, a bank, uh, you know, to allow for more of a natural diversion, sediment diversion. Um, and one of those is the mid Barataria, another is uh, Breton Sound. And the major issue for, for everybody surrounding this has to do really with, um, you know, our current um, recreational and commercial fishing, uh, you know, fisheries um, and how those either will be changed without doing anything or will be changed with the diversions. And for everybody involved, I think it's, it's a negotiation along those lines is like, how do we lose less, you know? And my whole deal is that, you know, I, I tr always try to listen to scientists, and but I also realize that the fishers are down there living it every day. So if the, you can't go in to a place and say, hey, you know, this is what's going to happen to the river, and this is what's going to happen to the marsh, because a lot of times it ain't that way, uh, no matter how smart of a scientist you are. And they 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 understand a whole lot about how how the you know how things work down there the ecosystems and so they need to be primary you know seat holders at the table and you know and especially if we're going to make these changes they also need to be compensated um, because we can't ask people to give up their lives you know so that the rest of us might have more land in the future whatever it is it's just it's not fair so um, and then, you know, there are other types of uh, less controversial sorts of like the berms. Some of those were, were kind of, I guess they were developed, um, you know, to kind of mitigate land loss um, and also be protective against like, uh, they made a lot of the berms during the BP spill. And they've, they've been able to reuse some of the materials from those berms 
to help shore up some like the barrier islands, which is another thing that as far as I can tell, a lot of folks are on the same page in terms of the barrier islands, helping shore those up. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of fishers talk, talk about this as well, but that seems to be a pretty universal, universally popular idea is building up those barrier islands. Um, and then there's, you know, there's dredging of uh, sediment throughout the marshes and, and, you know, using, reusing sediment in different ways and, and, and uh, both natural and artificial or man-made uh, structures to um, to kind of help with that. So those are some. That's a breakdown of a few different types of of uh, restoration. Gotcha. There. Um. So I'm gonna. <clears throat> I'm, I'm I'm conscious of the time. I want to. Yeah. I I don't want to take us too long, but I want to hit a couple of things. Maybe a um. A, uh, a if you will a lightning rod. A oh. round of so um you've got a chance to 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 tell you, your colleagues in the culinary community what should they be worried about why they should care about climate change what what do you tell them real quick well i would just say that that if if we don't worry about it our days are numbered i mean everybody's days are numbered but we'll be some of the first to go and and uh you know that's that's no matter how creative you think you are in terms of, you know, being able to create something from nothing using gastronomic techniques or whatever. You're, you're, the fact is that, you know, our, you know, natural, you know, environment and, and everything that comes from it is, is, you know, what we do. So, um, yeah. And you mean, see I, it as a threat to business. Um, oh, definitely. Um, I also I do see it as an opportunity um, because I feel like um, you know we we have to you know in some ways I, you know when when we're dealing with with um, people whose ideas obviously aren't going to change. I at first I would I would bang my head against that wall, but I'm to the point where you just step around it, and it's like listen, if you want to be a part of this future. Um, you got to step up because things are moving quickly and, you know, both on the climate change side, but also on, on the opportunities to, to be a part of um, doing something about it. So if you want to be a part of doing something about it, then yeah, stop. You know, I mean, there are a million things that you can do on an everyday basis uh, to be, uh, to be on that side, on the right side of, of that. So well, I hope I hope your 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 culinary colleagues get the message. <clears throat> we'll help amplify it for you. Um, so I'm going to head in out quickly, but uh, just I'm, I'm going to read into the, that that you are, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, an a, an optimist when it comes to the community responding to climate change. Yeah, yeah, I am. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, I mean, I'm inspired by folks in our community, chefs that, you know, do it right and have been doing it right for a long time. And, you know, that's, that's part of what gives me, you know, the, the confidence to think that we can, we can make, we can do it. Awesome. Okay, so I don't want to get angry emails or, or comments. <clears throat> so um, let's go to the, to the insider culinary tips. Um, what do you think the biggest mistake home cooks make? Um, gosh, um, with respect to like seafood or just yeah. in general? I mean, seafood seems to be like this kind yeah. of. Well, I mean, this is kind of cliche, but I think it's probably overcooking. <laughs> you know, it's like um, so many times. I mean, I, very few times have I heard people complain you know, at dinners or, or such that something is way undercooked. And if so, that can be remedied very quickly. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, and that, that, you know, even just using the old, you know, the, the old, uh, um, you know, way that you, you check the doneness of a, of a steak is pretty much works with, with, uh, uh, most fish as well. Um, you know, just, you don't want it to be, so solid that it's cracking apart or, or just um, doesn't have any give to it. Um, and then, 
Uh, the other thing I would say would be like um, also just making sure that that um, you know they take their time and really treat that fish with with I, a lot of respect because sure. when you do that you get you end up with a product that's just so far superior and you can you can put um, even a, a fillet that that a chef that really didn't care or didn't know. Uh, how to work with right next to one that really did and, and does care. And you'll see a huge difference. And, and that, that will also taste different. And so, I mean, I would, I would say, I mean, learn about, you know, you have to learn about, you know, how to bake. You should learn about how to, you know, how to clean your fish, how to prepare it. Um, you know, it, it's not, it's not just a piece of meat. So. Awesome. So to me, um, it sounds like simple. If you tr if you treat fish like you treat a steak, um, simple preparation. You know, don't overcook it. Mm -hmm. um, understand what fresh and what isn't. Um, yeah. um, I, I I will admit to this prejudice for years and years and years. I never wanted to have frozen fish but mm -hmm. but i think is that that rap is sort of not not valid really i mean isn't well there there's so many different ways that things are are um that things are processed and and frozen too so you know it's, it's kind of night and day between you know uh you know a bag of 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 shrimp that's been, um, you know, sprayed with some preservatives and instant frozen then bangs around in a, in a plastic bag through how many different thousands of miles or country, you know, different countries or whatever it is and ends up, you know, at, at your local supermarket, you know, that versus, um, something that's like, like Lance, he's a, always a great, uh, always a great uh, example, you know, somebody who's using, you know, 60 below plate freezers on the boat and that, that stuff is getting sorted right on to those plate freezers. Those are the freshest fr uh, shrimp you can get, you know, unless you're actually consuming them out of the net, you right. know, I mean, those, that's as fresh as you can get because there's, there's pretty much zero cell loss. And that's why, you know, like Louisiana uh, universe or, Louisiana State University is using his process as kind of the model for a lot of uh, processing of, of shrimp in the state. So, so you um, you can good you can get good frozen fish absolutely <clears throat> as long as you're not just getting the large chain. In, in fact, know. we do we do two things here. We have we have both a cryogenic freezer that goes to eighty below, and we also awesome. and we also have an aging cabinet. So we will use one or both sometimes in, uh, in tandem to do different work. We're sometimes experimenting, but we found some methods with different types of fish that really do work, um, you know, in, in improving shelf life, but also improving flavor and texture a whole lot. So, um, so going out with when you can't eat at Carmo or your cafe, what's your favorite restaurant in, in, in New Orleans? Oh man, that's tough. Um, well, you know, I, I have to say we, we, we tend to go out, you know, sometimes when, by the time we get out of here, it's too late to get a reservation anywhere. So it tends to be a lot of like, okay, where can we get some pizza? Where can we get, you know, a lot of that mom and pop places, if we can get, you know, a dozen oysters at 9 p.m., that's awesome, you know, and maybe some corn mac choux and, and uh, some uh, peel and eat shrimp for me, that's, that's divine. Awesome. Um, uh, but we have, you know, of course, we have a really deep, rich uh, uh, food ways culture here, you know, so um, we'll, we'll also go to some of the storied restaurants. Um, and then we have, we have a lot of folks, especially with seafood, like, you know, uh, Pesh and GW Fins and, you know, some which are actually we're just right by Pesh. And um, so, yeah, there, there are great options uh, down here for, 
you know, both the, the more traditional New Orleans style Cajun Creole cuisine, uh, and also some, some stuff that's um, kind of on a, on a different path. Awesome. Well, yeah. I, I want to thank you for a great conversation. Um, really take, really appreciate the time and, and I appreciate you. Your, your, well, you know, sharing your knowledge and experience and, and I hope we can get you on for another waterside chat. Anytime. Awesome. Well, as I said to at the beginning, um, this chat will be available on uh, YouTube, Facebook, and our website. We're working on our next ch chat in uh, in May. And until then, thank you and goodbye. Thanks. Thanks, folks. Bye. Bye-bye.